and Tyler has in his basement um, <clears throat> WWF action figures, along with like the the ring that they are supposed to wrestle in. Yeah, th- if you're like 35 to 45 years old, this was a part of your childhood more than likely. It's the blue plastic ring. Uh, you know, like the Bushwhackers and the, you know, Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan. <laughs> they all were there. Superfly Jimmy Snuka. All of them are there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're you're sitting on the floor and like the, you're not only like playing with the toys and like how they're like supposed to be making moves on each other, but also narrating it as it happens. Of course. <laughs> so, and it, there for sure is footage of it. Yeah. What's up, everybody, and welcome to The Stable Cyclist. My name is JP, and this week, we've got a bonus episode on tap, something that is different, but something I'm very proud to pull back the curtain on, and it works in tandem with something very special on YouTube that releases Friday. So I don't know if that's tonight, wherever you're listening, or yesterday, but it released on Friday. Back in February, I released the film Matahe, a documentary following the stories of Tyler Huber and Kelly McGelkey at this year's Matahe 100. But the story of how we got the story was crazy and complex and unique, to be honest. And so for this bonus pod, I wanted you to meet one of those people, another unlikely hero in this story. There truly is no documentary without him. And he is one of my absolute closest friends as well. The guy listed as DP for this documentary, Aaron Haugen, came into the studio to talk with me about the project, the near disasters we had along the way, and why he became the hero of production, and how we figured out how in the hell we were going to tell this story once the dust settled from the race. There's no ads today, just two friends talking about working together in a really beautiful place. While there are no ads today, I will ask you to snap a screenshot while you listen and share on social media and help us keep spreading the love of the Stable Cyclist podcast. You can tag the Stable Cyclist as well because you, our amazing listeners, are the number one way that this podcast continues to grow. When you're done there, you can head over to YouTube to watch the full behind-the-scenes episode for Matahe, where Tyler Huber, Kelly McGelkey, and race director Nick Yabara share their stories from making the Matahe film. All right, enough of all that. Let's bring in Aaron Haugen to the studio. Well, Aaron Haugen, uh, this is our first in-person podcast we've had, and uh, unless you're really reading the credits carefully of the Matahe film, most people on the Stable Cyclist might not have any idea who you are. And you are the guy who basically made sure the footage on race day and race weekend happened because uh, I I wasn't operating super well, as we'll get into uh, in a little bit. Um, but you're also one of my closest friends, and you teach in a nearby school. And so I thought it would be good if we got together and just talked about how the heck this documentary kind of came together as my dog comes and checks you out for the 50th time today. So your background in the Badlands is not limited to just hopping in a car with me last summer and heading out there. What, why is that place so special to you and why are you so familiar with it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We, as a family, grew up going out there. Um, we went out, I don't countless times at probably every other year for a while. And we had family friends that had land out there, so we were able to stay easily. Um, we did the traditional Medora things at different times, and then also we'd just go out there and just be there. Um, and so it was always a place that, I don't know, like when you've been out there now, you're like, this is a place that just is like you relax. And then it's just you kind of can just let go a little bit. And so it's always been that for me. Um, it's a place that... I think like nature kind of takes over because there isn't a whole lot of just other stuff you can do. Um, and so it's always, it's just been a comfort place. It's not, it's definitely not somewhere where I'm like, I, I want to go out there and set roots down, 
but it's also a place where I'm like, ah, if I can find a reason to get out there, like I'm going to go and we're going to spend a little bit of time there. And I, we left after the premiere in December, I think it was. And like, we're driving out of the Badlands 10 miles out, out or whatever. And it's like, I think I mentioned to you, like, it's just not fun leaving. So, and, and like I said, it's not, maybe not somewhere I'm going to live someday, but Man, it's a place that I just enjoy spending time at. Well, and, and you've told me some crazier stories about being in a four by four with your cousins out and making mischief, and and what maybe some more old school people would know before the Mata Hay Trail was even there, uh, the kind of things people would go do out in the Badlands. And so, definitely, the idea of adventure going there, I think, is forefront in your mind, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. Like, we we had cousins growing up that were up in Williston, which is north of the, north of Medora area, uh, 80, 80-ish miles, I think. Um, and so we spent a lot of time out there. We'd spend winters out there pheasant hunting and, yeah, driving around. They're older than me, so they had driver's licenses and were cool and stuff like that. And, yeah, we're tooling around in different vehicles and going out and finding stuff to do. And yeah, it was a blast just getting to spend time out there. And, and yeah, adventure is probably the way to, the way to describe it because there wasn't a whole lot else. Like it's, there's no big city. Like even you're driving into Dickinson, like you're going to go hit Walmart and go maybe get a couple other things. And then it's like, all right, now what? So you had originally been the guy on, on tap to be my support person as I was supposed to go out there and race, I have this big mountain bike accident in July, uh, you know, a major concussion or severe concussion, however we want to label it. And I call you and say, Hey, I had this accident and I'm not going to race, but let's go out there and film. Uh, a, why, why did you not freak out over that idea? Um, and, and B, did you really know what you were getting yourself into? Uh, first, no, not a clue what I was getting into. And I, we'll talk about that and get into that here in a little bit, I think. But, um, when you called me, I suppose it was probably mid July at that point when you had kind of started to recover a little bit and told me you had the, had a concussion and had the accident and let's just go film Tyler. And I was like, I don't know who Tyler is. And so now obviously <laughs> I do, but I was like, why not? Like we already had the weekend set aside. Um, both of us were able to get away and, and we were, had plans to race. Um, and so I, I think it's a little bit of a, a trust thing and just being like, ah, you might as well. Um, but also like, there's a history of like, well, things that John films, like they tend to turn out all right. And so we're going to, let's just go see what happens. And if, if we get like an eight to 10 minute kind of short out of this thing from the weekend, then that's going to be pretty cool. And it turned into a little bit more than that, but it, it, uh, yeah, there was just a, tr- a trust built in of like, ah, let's, let's just go see what happens and a little bit of, uh, going with the flow. From- but w- we get out there and people need to understand initially we were part of the support team for Tyler then. And we were a part of meetings with Tyler and Melissa of like, we're going to have to run SAG at some point because the river was too high. So we were going to have to split the difference. And this plan involved me having to cross the river on my bicycle, uh, on my mountain bike, and then catching up with whoever was on the back half and continuing to film. The weather hits, the course gets all turned around, and we realize, A, we, we're not going to have to SAG at all because Melissa can do everything. But also... This gives us a day to go film. This totally changes how we are going to film this race. Talk, what was that day like, uh, I believe on Saturday, where we were just able to go out and we were scouting for Nick 100%. We were trying to find out, like, are these trails even usable? But also we were trying to film sometimes wisely and sometimes not. Yeah, it uh, the, the race being moved back a day was probably the biggest advantage I had as far as filming goes for a couple different reasons. But first off, like as much time as I've spent out there in the past, like not once have I knowingly been on the Mata Hay trail and not once did I ever look at a course map, except for like, I mean, maybe for five minutes, like the week leading up to the race. Um, when I was like, I probably kind of should know how this works before we're going to head out and, and film this. And so 
like I had briefly glanced, I knew that it was like a north to south point to point course and that on our way out there, at least at the time that that's kind of how it was going to work. And we were going to, um, have to play a little bit of a part in helping Tyler, like finish the race. That being said, like I've spent so little time around mountain biking and like the courses, like I've, I've been around Medora when it's dry and when it's like just this arid desert and I've been around when it's wet a little bit. Um, but I didn't know what the Matahe race was like. Um, and so like when we're driving out there and Nick calls and he's like, ah, we don't really know what we're going to do. And we're like, okay, cool. Like, we'll we'll figure it out. And, um, when the day, when they finally made the call to move the race back, like all of a sudden, like we were able to probably prepare way more than we ever would have had been able to, had it been the next day. Cause we didn't get out, we didn't get out to, uh, Watford till probably, I don't know if it was five o'clock or something that evening. And when they're scheduled to go off at 7 AM or whatever, the next, the next morning, like that 14 hour time gap, considering we were supposed to, you know, probably eat something and set up a tent and like do all these things to prepare for and, the day and break a tent and, and, bra- <laughs> and break a tent. Yeah. There's a picture somewhere of that. Um, it, like it would have just been a whirlwind whirlwind and it w- things would have turned out, but it wouldn't have been the same with the day, with the race being moved back. So we were able to go out and film. We probably left by eight thirty or nine in the morning, Saturday morning then. And we didn't get back to the campsite till probably seven, seven thirty that night, if I remember right. And so we were out for 10 hours, um, and driving the course, which really helped me. Um, and then also like just getting to like hike into different spots and kind of plan out a little bit of like, okay, if we're here, then we can maybe shoot from this angle and start to see like how the race is going to form. Um, especially considering that I think for the first time that it was uh, out and back and it was not going to be point to point anymore. Yeah. It, it gave us all these opportunities to look at things totally differently than we had coming in. And all of a sudden we started recognizing places like, Oh, actually we can go here and shoot them going the opposite direction. And we can see for like a mile. And those things really worked themselves out. Well, we get through Saturday not only were we out on the trail that day, we did interviews with Tyler and Melissa that day as well. And again, not really knowing where this was going to go at the time. They were still long interviews, but they were very vague. And uh, we get to race today. And very quickly, I start to show that like my ability to make good decisions, like the accident remnants are lingering longer than they should be and my ability to make like in the moment decisions is poor um we didn't film the start other than on a stationary gopro that was my mistake i missed them coming through like two miles out on course with the drone which was the whole reason i had been sent out there and you as the day develops you continually have these conversations with me that I, I mean, you can tell what they were like, and then also what your frustration level was as we went through the day. Yeah, I think uh, indicator number one should have been so you were going to pick me up um, Friday morning. I had a thing to go to for my daughter. You were going to pick me up, and we were going to go. And you said, Yeah, we'll just kind of split driving for the weekend. And you picked me up and drove to Walmart. We grabbed a few supplies. I hopped in the driver's seat, and I think. The next time I got out of the driver's seat was at my house on Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning when we got back. And so at that point, I was like, okay, like this, like I, you had some things to take care of and people to communicate with. So that was part of it for sure. Um, but then there's other parts where I'm like, I, I don't think he feels good enough to actually be driving for five hours today. Um, you were correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so that was indicator number one. Um, yeah. And then. Like, we still didn't know, like, what the documentary was going to become the documentary. And so, like, initially when things don't go well and you're like, yeah, you were out talking with Tyler, interviewing him a little bit as he's warming up the Sunday morning uh, of the race. um, And you're like, we'll stop back at camp quick. 
And all of a sudden, like, I hear the Star Spangled Banner playing as they're, like, getting ready to race. And no one had stopped back at camp. And I'm like, okay, they didn't come back to camp. Like, And I'm, like, starting to book it with cameras and stuff, <laughs> trying to catch the beginning of the race. Um, like, at that point, I was like, okay, like, all right, that didn't go to plan. But, like, it, same deal. Like, if this is an 8 to 10 minute, like, film, like, we're going to be all right. Like, we got hours of racing which once again like i didn't know i've been around cycling enough to know like that there's some long grueling days but i didn't know that this was necessarily going to be like probably eight to 12 hours depending on how the day goes for tyler and until like probably on the way out there i had looked at like previous years results and been like oh like the good guys are like nine maybe sub nine in perfect conditions yeah. And I didn't know Tyler was good. I had no clue. Like I knew he was your friend. Okay. And so like I was like, we're gonna be like we're gonna be in for it. And like we've got all kinds of data to make up for it. But then as the day goes and then like you missed the drone footage at one point and then like we stop and get a <laughs> we stop. I think it was at check B and like I'm up the trail probably half a mile with a couple different GoPros and a camera on a tripod. And you call me and you're like, yeah, I forgot to put batteries in the drone. <laughs> and I was like, okay, uh, Howard, like there's, some, there's continued like check boxes of like, we're missing this footage and then we're missing this footage. And, like, I don't know how we're going to have enough stuff to actually put together a film without significant behind the scenes work afterwards. Um, and then we get to the point where we're like, now I'm supposed to drop you off later in the day and just let you go. And like, you're, you're sharp enough to like, we were on the same page with the plan. The plan was actually running relatively smoothly overall, as far as like get to this point, run out, you're here, you're here, you're here. The realization that I was a disaster didn't come till a week or two later going through footage and listening to our interactions yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. me saying things like, uh, I forgot to push record or <laughs> I forgot to like, I, I forgot to put batteries in the camera and you would just be like, uh, okay. In the background. So, but on the day it wasn't, I don't, I didn't feel like, man, the train's going off the tracks here. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 So, no, you're... so when I, when I said, Hey, drop me off at check a, I'm going to ride in seven miles to the top of never ending to, to film these, epic shots of Tyler or whoever's yeah. in the lead, you know, at the time it didn't feel like this was a dangerous proposition or something stupid that I was about to go do. No, I had, I had no doubts. Uh, you were going to get there. Like th there's that no doubt in my mind, like there's enough people coming on the track and that's part of the course too this year, especially where like there's some shorter routes and shorter races that are going through there that I was like, all right, like there's going to be people and it turns out there was people checking on you, even though you were trying to just film. Um, and like, so I, you were going to be safe. I wasn't concerned about that. Um, I also had no clue if we were going to get anything video wise and it turned out we did and it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but it was about the only thing I did right all day to be <laughs> totally <laughs> honest on the camera. Uh, for people that have watched the documentary or that, um, are going to go watch it. Any, almost anything you see during the race itself, you shot it because I was, I was such a mess trying to remember to do things or not being able to remember, except for the stuff that you see late when Tyler's out in the lead and the music's really epic and he's heading back to camp, but pretty much anything else was, was your doing um, the only other shot that I got that was a success was when I hopped on the bike and rode next to them on the road while you were, you were waiting for me up ahead. Uh, and Kyle left, which was driving our vehicle back to us. So th there was a lot of coordination of things, but yeah, most, most of what you see in the documentary is because of Aaron just being steady all day and not even necessarily knowing what you should be shooting or what, what you, uh, were supposed to shoot but you just did and that's you know it ends up being great in the end yeah some of it like you look back and you're like i i don't have a videography or photography background at all um i've taught i think two photography units in 11 <laughs> years of teaching 
and so and not like classes but just like little mini units and one of them was during student teaching which is such a whirlwind that yeah like nothing is going great at that time um and so like i had enough of a background like teaching wise to be like here's kind of how you think of things but to actually execute it like you, you know with teaching like you can explain how things go, but then the kids get to go do it for 45 minutes and you're just like answering questions and troubleshooting. <laughs> you don't actually get to do this stuff. Like I can, I teach Photoshop and Illustrator stuff and I can do it because I've put time in outside of class, but like they come in for five days a week, 45 minutes a day, and they're just like in Photoshop and doing stuff. And then like, there's a couple of talented kids each class where I'm like, you're way better than me. Yeah. Like it's not even close. And so, yeah. yeah, videography wise, I was just shooting and like, Really hoping to get Tyler in the frame. Um, turns out that we got Kelly in the frame in hindsight as well. Um, and then hoping for some good backgrounds, which like the Badlands offer without fail. A hundred percent. And so, yeah, we, we get Kelly in there, thankfully, uh, as it goes. Because like you said, initially this was totally 100% going to be a film about Tyler. And I want to talk about, and this is where we really pull back the curtain on things, I want to talk about how disappointed we were that the day ended. Like, and, and I have to say, I, like, I'm honest about this. And I was honest with Kelly about it, even though he has become a very close friend of mine through this process. Um, a, a person who, you know, yeah, I'm very transparent with. And, but even at the time, uh, the shot where you do see how we felt about him winning is he comes around the last corner and I step out into the gravel road and I give him a thumbs up. And I was just, to be totally honest, I was being polite yeah. because I was in my, my internal dialogue was like, Oh, what are we going to do now? Like we, we had this story about this amateur winning and it didn't happen. And now what? And yeah. And, and your there's there's funny stories from you that Kelly at the end of the at the Medora premiere asked you like did you get footage of me right after I finished and I was like crying on the ground and you said <laughs> no I was so furious and irate <laughs> because so what ha what happens if you've seen the documentary you've seen it but like they come through the finish line and they're supposed to go back out for another like eleven miles or something like that um, and when they were coming into the campground where the finish line was the first time, like we knew Tyler was ahead and we had information that he had a gap and however many minutes that was, is a little bit up in the air and depends on who we had asked at the time, but he had a gap and we're like, this is, this is like, you can't write this. Mm -hmm. Um, and simultaneously we had had conversations in the car throughout the day of like, oh, we're really good at telling stories of second place finishers. And so like, <laughs> How, like how do you tell a story about a winner like besides that it writes itself like yeah. this is not really kind of how things work um and so they came through and whatever the gap had been when they came through i was in the at the finish line when they came through the first time and it was like tyler comes through i'm fired up he's in first and it's not 20 seconds later i think i had started my stopwatch because i was curious on the gap it's like 18 seconds and all of a sudden Kelly comes through and he is flying. And I'm like, Oh boy, like this is, now we've got a race. Um, and like then the cycling racing background that I have, like all I wanted was a drone sitting up in the air so I could just watch <laughs> them and just like be like, this is an incredible race. Um, but yeah, so then I'm set up behind the finish line and I don't know who's going to come through first. So no matter who comes through, like I have to film. And so I can see it's not a half mile between, between a quarter and a half mile down. There's a last straightaway. And so I can see, and somebody comes around the corner, I hit record and I'm standing behind the camera, thankfully probably because I'm sure I hit record and my head just hung. And I was just <laughs> like, you gotta be kidding me. And same thing as you, like, you yeah. knew Kelly a little bit and interacted yeah. with him a little bit. I didn't know him at all. And you had said, he seems like a great guy. And I was like, okay, like, cool. But, like, our guy is not – like, our guy's the guy. And he's not on camera Our right story now. just got ripped up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and so I, I film him. He comes through the finish line. I figured, like, that it was important that we get the winner because somehow it's going to tie in. 
Um, and he's, he's very emotional coming before he even crosses the line. Um, and then like he crosses and stops and I cut the camera and then he's like on the ground crying and super emotional, um, for reasons that we probably find out at towards the end of the documentary. Yeah. And like, I'm behind the camera, like literally kicking the ground, like <laughs> the cartoons, like, because I'm so frustrated that Tyler didn't win. Yeah, so that that led to a very – and it was, like, a great day for Tyler. You know, like, second yeah, – yeah. like, you know. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. It, it was just in our view of, like, we're trying to tell a story, and the story didn't turn out quite how we had thought it would with 10 miles to go. And we didn't quite know what to do with that. And that was, you know, we got in the car that night, drove back to Tyler's house because that's where we were going to stay yeah. that night. And when we got to Tyler's house, we had interviews left to do with Tyler and Melissa about the day um, and how that went. And But in the interim between CCC campground and getting to Tyler's house was kind of an ongoing discussion between you and I about what am I as the writer going to do about this? And is there a story like what I, I don't quite know what to do. But by the time we got to Tyler's house, we had figured it out. Yeah, it when the story just gets blown up the way that it does, and it, like it, it was written perfectly for if like I think the total was 104 miles, like it had been written perfectly for like 93 miles, <laughs> and like which is a high percentage, we'd all take that, and then it wasn't, and we're, we're like okay, so this is a long conversation that we have from Watford, essentially probably the pretty much the whole way to yeah. Bismarck, back to Tyler's house, and it's like as you kind of start talking through the story and like, okay, how can you frame this? Um, we had done interviews with Tyler and Melissa multiple times and had more to come obviously, but the realization quickly becomes like, ah, we, we kind of got to include Kelly and not knowing at the time, like that he would be a willing participant, yeah. um, or participate nearly as much as he does in hindsight. Um, but you have to like, as much as the story is about Tyler and the amateur and the comeback story and uh, the like quote unquote hero status of Kelly, like the story also is about Kelly and just like who he is and what mountain biking has done for him throughout his life. Um, how did you like contact him? How did you bring him into the conversation? Um, and then how did that like develop into him being like, a or possibly the central character in the documentary um so almost immediately after our conversations going to bismarck uh and going back to tyler's house i reached out to him and i don't know if it was through social media or whatever and i just said you know like i said before like you mentioned i did have a relationship with him but it was very much at a distance he and i knew each other through our work with gopher graham and mental health advocacy and so like we knew of each other and i knew that he ran a film company and so my in my mind i was like the long shot here is that he he knows how to help me make this happen if he is so willing and and ultimately i was just very truthful with him that i said i am concerned that i have a story where you have become the villain and i did not know he like I did not want him to be the villain. If you've met Kelly, he's the kindest person uh, that you will come across. And uh, you can go back and listen. He's the original interview on this podcast. But also, um, yeah, I just was like, Kelly, I, I can't have you be in the story as the villain. And you're not like, that's not who you are. And I said, I have some ideas of how we can do this, like how we can make this work. But yeah, are you in or do you want to participate? And he came back with, yeah, totally. I actually just told my wife, I think you might be reaching out to me uh, because, you know, like I, I knew that the story didn't maybe develop as you had hoped yeah. it would. And then he said, I can help get it set up on on my end, what needs to happen so we can enter, can do this. And so he had his DP that works for him, Luke Askelson, come and set up in their cinema camera and do get like this great backdrop that you see in the documentary. And then we FaceTimed each other while he, you know, recorded into this super nice camera. And 
what I thought would be maybe a 20 minute conversation turned into like an hour and 45 minutes. Um, and that doesn't mean Kelly's windy. It's just like he would, he, he's a great storyteller and he understands exactly what needs to happen. And to be quite honest, like when you do this for a living, like he does and makes documentaries, he understands what I was looking for. And so that was when I, for me, I finally realized, like, I think we got a lot more than a little cute YouTube video. This is going to be a feature film. And then it was trying to like piece it all together. And so I reached back out to Tyler and said, Tyler, I got to come interview again. Um, and, and yeah, we kind of, away we went after that Kelly interview because it was just so in depth and he gave me pieces that we could play off of and work with in the story that I didn't know prior to that. Yeah. And you go back like in the documentary, you go back to the point where like you get the kid footage of him and him just absolutely destroying himself a couple times. And like, it's, it's these things that like, un- until you reach out to him, like the documentary isn't the documentary without like some of what he has, not necessarily given, but just offered. And like, here's some pieces like, but also like he knows from a writing standpoint, like the, the storyteller still has to be able to take and weave it together. Well, and that's so important that I want to just stress to people is part of the reason the documentary has been successful and people like it is because of all those pieces he gave me, you know, there's hundreds of photos he sent me and, you know, videos of him on the bike crashing and, uh, you know, riding, snowboarding and crashing. And like, that's really effective. That's really important. And so when people get put in the situation where the story is being told about them, the more they can give the producer, give the writer, the better the story is going to be able to be told. Right. And so like on that, with more background information just being needed, um kelly's main say guy is his cousin ryan and ryan's at so many races and there's footage in the documentary of him from years ago and just working and he and kelly are honestly a a really really well-oiled machine um and so how did how did you go about contacting him how did you go about getting his interviews set up and making sure that like that part of the story is a, a closed loop instead of just kind of dangling out there yeah i i knew that ryan was like very technologically savvy. Um, and so I knew we, we initially had a plan, a plan where I was going to mail him some gear to make it all work. Uh, and then we we're going to do something kind of similar to what Kelly and I did. And Ryan lives out in Vegas. And then Ryan was like, well, actually I'll be in Fargo for a work trip. And, and I was like, okay, well I'll like come to your hotel. And then he was like, well, actually my part of my work trip got canceled here. I'm going to come to you. And so we, uh, you know, my house at 8 p.m. isn't real conducive to for an hour and a half sit down interview with five kids running around and a dog and my wife and everybody. Here. Like, so I asked one of my neighbors, I said, hey, can I come and like set up in your barn and it'll be silent. Um, their barn is not used anymore. It's just storage. And uh, they were like, yeah, come on over. So Ryan and I met there, uh, shot an interview. And again, like. You, you, I knew what I had gotten out of Melissa and it was like gold, right? But you don't always know when you have, you're talking to like a support person, how much storytelling they're going to give you. And again, I sat down with Ryan and I was like, it'll be a 20 minute interview. And an hour later we were done. And I was like, oh my goodness. And, and you watch the documentary and you're like, Ryan's in there for like three clips. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's all we could like fit. But there's all kinds of stuff. And some of it this month, uh, on YouTube, I'm putting out different videos, and one of them is about SAG support. And you'll see a lot more of that Ryan interview that right. ended up on the cutting room floor for the doc because it's just such good stuff. But that's how, you know, Ryan ended up in the doc, Kelly ended up in the doc, all these people far away ended up sitting down with me, sometimes in person, sometimes not. So we've talked, Kelly is in the videography business and creates and is a master of all domains within documentaries like he's extremely talented um so how did how did you guys go about planning and how'd you guys go about shooting the footage of him when he was riding out in colorado that's at the beginning of the documentary yeah so that was actually the very last uh shots or those were the last shots that happened um we got or I got very late in the like writing process and I was almost done. And I knew like I needed some kind of 
calm. There's not a lot of calm in this film. You know, it's, it's kind of like wall to wall action. And I was like, I, I really need some calm and I needed a way to get him not in a race setting, just riding his bike. And so I said, uh, Hey Kelly, like I got one more ask. Um, can you get somebody just like, have you riding your bike? And, and I said like, you can shoot it on an iPhone. I don't care. <laughs> like I just need footage. Um, and, and people won't may or may not realize this. There's footage within the rest of the doc from the race. That's iPhone footage. Um, there's, there's like cinematic looking shots mm-hmm. of landscapes that is iPhone footage. Um, iPhones are incredible, but it, so I was like, Go shoot with an iPhone. Like I, I can clean that up. But in his world, yeah, he not was, he was just like, no, like let's do this for real. Um, so again, L- Luke Askelson, who like so much again, like we owe you so much with this film. We owe Luke so much and his time he put in. Um, Luke is like a big time DP for like he goes and shoots like for series and like legit things. Uh, Kelly called him up and was like, hey, we need to shoot this scene. And so Luke came. And Luke sat on the back tailgate of his pickup truck and uh, country music singer Hunter Burnett uh, drove the truck. And the only instructions were you can't speed up or slow down so much that you flip Luke out of the truck. (laughs) And they drove like on like a four block square in Colorado um, on like one day that was nice. And they shot at a bunch of different speeds. They shot some garage scenes of Kelly getting ready to go on a ride. And, uh, yeah. And then, and, and a different, they, like I said, a different speed. So like some were slow motion and, um, some things they didn't have sound with. So I had to sound stage that stuff when it came to me, but it's just incredible footage. And, and after like this big intense intro, you get like this super chill stuff of Kelly just cruising around the block, literally, uh-huh. uh, by his house. And you can just think about Luke and Hunter trying to make this all work. Uh, and it, it, it's awesome, you know, and this is, that's what people don't understand always that like, there's so many pieces and so many moving parts and like all those people listed in the, in the credits, like they're so instrumental to making this happen. And everybody just sees me, like I'm the producer, or I'm the writer it's none of it happens without these other pieces, you know? And I feel bad. Like I didn't know the Hunter piece until like a month ago. Yeah. Um, and like, he's not listed in the credits and I would totally have listed him, like truck driver, Hunter yeah. Burnett, you know, uh, just cause it's funny. Um, <laughs> but yeah, every, like everybody's got a hand in this and it's huge. And when you get a 90 or 90, 95 minute documentary that comes out when you're like, I think I'm done. And, and then you realize like, I, there has, this has to be cut down. Like, how do you, how do you go about the process of like, okay, this seems really important. Um, but maybe to make it a little more consumable or more marketable to others. Like, how do you, how do you cut? Like I sat in on interviews with Tyler and Melissa with you, like, they provided fantastic stories and fantastic information that aren't in the documentary. And so like, how do you go about those choices? A lot of it comes down to like figuring out what is nice to know versus what is needed to be known in the story. And, and you'll hear writers talk about that in different ways, but this isn't my first rodeo doing this. Um, you know, I did Kazen, uh, which you show up in a few different times. Uh, I did We Are From Pelican, uh, which is a seven episode, like long form documentary, also on YouTube. You have to decide what is important and what isn't. And there's just certain things that aren't really relevant to the story, even though they're interesting. And right. the best example that I can give is I've had a, a number of people say to me, well, I wish you would have told us what Madahe means, yeah. right? Like really relevant question. Yeah. And, and there, there are these uh, incredible stories about how the trail came about, about the people that are involved. Um, Gerard Baker, the man who named the trail, why he named it the way he did, what it means to the Native Americans who used to live there. Those are incredible stories. They, within this story, they weren't part of this story. And that doesn't mean they're not important. And so uh, you come to a point where you have to figure out like, yeah, it's really nice to know what Matahe means. And trust me, there's a future project that we're working on 
about those stories. But for this one, it wasn't important. And and the thing, you know, you say 90 to 95 and people are like, it's an hour, dude. And I'm like, well, it was an hour to hour. It was 95 minutes initially. And there was the first 30 minutes of the film were all about those questions. Right. About how the trail got here. And and if you watch, there's a there's an older guy, Uncle Phil. He's not even credited in the film. But he's the very first quote you hear uh, in the in the film and his stuff was gold, but most of it didn't fit within the type of storytelling. So I had this 30 minute open all about how the trail got there and how these things happen. And at some point I was like, people are gonna like click off before they ever get to the actual story here. I've got to take these 30 minutes and I've got to cut them down to two. Right. And so I found the opening song and I was like, whatever, you need to tell in those first two minutes for people to understand, you got to fit it here. And if you can't fit it in here, it's not going to fit. No. And that includes the quote from Phil, which like you could watch 90 seconds of the documentary. And if it's the first 90 seconds, you're like, oh, I kind of get the bad lines. Exactly. And that that is what the writers in any story is trying to figure out. Like how quickly can I communicate what we're talking about? And how can I make sure people stay engaged? And when you go through that process, then you start sometimes sadly cutting out all these other pieces that are interesting but aren't going to keep the person engaged yeah so in the past uh, the couple projects you've done in the past uh, largely revolved around and you built the score for most of them um and so like how did you go about that in this project and like what pieces did you take from the past that you're like i think i can not not that you can use the same stuff but i can use some of these same techniques here versus like how much of it was like this is brand new and we're building this whole new like adventure documentary versus like a basketball focused one or the soccer one that you had done a few years ago yeah certainly the music plays a huge piece in the emotion like just in how we feel when we watch film um time was the biggest enemy in this one i i knew that we wanted to premiere it out west by early december and then I knew beyond that, February was my deadline. But really, once we got to December, it needed to be mostly done. And scoring a film or scoring a series takes the most time because you're having to make sure everything hits when it's supposed to and you're having to make sure all these things play out. And I knew, I knew from the very beginning I just didn't have the time to do that or the energy. However, I still knew like in my head – if I'm writing this part, I want it to be like this vibe. Right. And I know where I, these are where I need my hits to be. And so I kind of built it as I went. I used art, uh, a company called Artlist, which is royalty free, you pay a subscription. Um, and it's, it's not my favorite thing to do because I really like the creative process, but I, I just didn't have time to write the score this time. And so that's that's just what I did. And a lot of times it was finding like, okay, here's a song for this section. Now we got to make this section fit that. Right song so right no that that makes complete sense so at some point like we're building we you are building towards <laughs> <laughs> when i got home when i got home monday morning after the after we were all done other than like sending you pictures from my phone and videos from my phone like my part was completely done and being a sounding board potentially for yeah. like am i remembering this the right way correct and that's not even like it's a little bit to do with concussion but like you and I have both listened to Malcolm Gladwell enough to know, like, our memories aren't good. Yeah. Like, we don't want a Brian Williams situation. No. no <laughs> right. And so you're building towards, like, this deadline in December, but also, like, more of a real deadline in February. And then other conversations happen where, like, okay, how is this going to get out to the masses? Like, is mm-hmm. where is this thing going to be released to the public? Um and so at what point during that process were you like, I think this might be a little bit bigger than I thought it was going to be? That's a good question. You know, it's when your friends tell you something is good, you, you know, you don't always know what, like your BS meter can't read that always or detect that. Um, so, you know, when you and and some of my other close friends would, be like, yeah, this is really good. I was always like, okay, thanks guys. Um, when we did the two premieres, 
And, and Kelly had told me this a lot ahead of time. He's like, you need to do premieres so you can sit in the room with a bunch of people and just watch them react. And I was like, ah, eh, whatever, man. And when we sat in Medora and then we sat in Bismarck, uh, and the Bismarck one especially, and I watched total strangers respond to this in the same way that my friends had responded to it, I, I was like, okay, I think, I think we're kind of, you know, cooking with gas here. Um, yeah. And then it was just, you still, it gets to be February 2nd and I'm in Denver and we had had a really good premiere on the first and, you know, Kelly's like, what do you want to do today? And I'm like, I don't want to sit around and wait for this thing to come out and just watch metrics on YouTube. So we end up walking it, you know, going up to Red Rocks and hiking around and just like literally driving around in the mountains to keep our mind off of it. Terrible. Yeah, it, it was it was terrible and wonderful all at the same yes. time. You know, it was just fantastic. Like, you know, like, let's yeah. just drive around. That's a good time. So, yeah, I, and I still didn't know. And I remember, I think, uh, then I got snowed in in Denver. I was staying with Kelly. And I remember, I think the second day it was out, it did like 7,000 views. And like most of my videos, you know, like they're about a very specific thing. They're about mental health in the bike world. So the audience is very small. Um, the, the people who follow this channel are very loyal, um, but, but it's niche for sure. And most of my videos, like if I would get a really good video, it was like, you know, like 500. And right, I, I would right. be like doing a cartwheel. And so I'm like, why? Like 7,000. And I'm getting like within 60 minutes, I'm getting like 1,800 views. And I'm like, what is going on? Right. And yeah, that was kind of when I realized like, okay. And, and the watch time was going equally through the roof. You know, it wasn't like people were just clicking on it and clicking out. They were watching the whole thing. And so I was just like, oh, okay, like this is, we, we did a good job here. Yeah, and I think the beauty of the premieres, which I hadn't thought of this until you mentioned that, but like the be beauty of the premieres is like you don't know when people are going to cry or laugh until like they watch it. And so, and you hear this with comedians all the time, like they they have this whole set list and it's going to be, you know, somewhere between like 10 and 60 minutes depending on who you are. And like they think it's funny and they think somebody's going to laugh at this point and then they like drop a line and it's kind of quiet. And then they like say something else and everyone's laughing and they're like, Oh, like that's the funny part. And like, it's the same when we're at the premieres in Medora and Bismarck, like there's times that people laughed and I'll like, I'm like sitting there like, oh, that's funny, huh? Uh, but, but it was, and people and, really and, enjoyed that. And the line that I, I think neither of us expected it's, it's honestly, it's right after I, like for the fourth time of the day, I said, Oh, I didn't remember turning camera on. And then and we're a magpie they're going back and they're still together. And in the film, there's like this great tension building yeah. and we hop in the car and I just say, I wonder when these guys are going to quit being homies and just <laughs> race. Yes. And like every time it didn't matter where the premieres were, people just died laughing at that. <laughs> and I, I, partly it's the tension in the moment, you know, you're very like on the edge of your seat and then we're just kind of like, huh, <laughs> what right. do you think buddy? Um, but, but also like, the premieres were so unique because in Medora, it was very much the people who are involved with the Madahe. So they were like on the edge of their seats just because it it's so personal to them. Yeah. And then in Bismarck, packed house at CC Therapy, and the people are there primarily because they love Tyler and, right. and they love Melissa, as they should. And, and they're going to boo Kelly when he wins. Yeah, like like they just want Tyler yeah, to do well. Yeah, there was no clapping when Kelly <laughs> won. It was really interesting. Um and then I go to Denver and we were with almost entirely Kelly's friends mm -hmm. and almost entirely people from the music industry and from the film industry. And they don't know a thing about bike racing. Right. But they were, they were finding a lot of the same things funny. They were finding a lot, you know, and like, it just brought me so much joy when one of the people there just turned around, like about the time that Tyler takes off and he just goes, this is so good and like <laughs> and like gives me a hug in the process and i'm like okay like this dude doesn't know anything about bike racing and like he's in right. and so yeah it just being with people getting to watch something together like and part of it is we just we we forget how important community is oh, you know yeah. we we forget how good it is just to sit and it's not because of covid like we've just in well, general part of it is part of it is but a lot of it is we've just isolated ourselves 
mm-hmm. you know, with with these phones sure. and and the ability to just be by ourselves, and we don't sit together with people and just like do something at the same time, yeah. and we don't sit with friends very often. And I think about why the, you know, I I spoke at the at the Bismarck mm-hmm. um, premiere. premiere, and and I just talked about like what they have is so incredible, you know, not because they all came together and watched this premiere, but like that's everything with the bike out there. Right. They understand the need to get together and hang out. It doesn't matter if you're fast or slow, we can support each other. We can love each other. Uh, and it's just incredible. And, and in general, like as people, we need to find those groups, you know, we need to find those, those opportunities to be with one another um, whether it's in a, a public setting or a private setting, getting together with friends and family, like we do sometimes with our families when our schedules allow it, but it's just good to be together. And, and we've missed out on that. And for, for you and I, I know going to those premieres was like really a good reminder of how important it is just to gather with people, even if you don't know them necessarily, right. but just to be together and like, we're all laughing at the same thing right now, or we're all <laughs> sad about the same thing. That's yeah. okay too. Yeah, for sure. And that, that sense of community that you can't just pretend it to happen. Like for that group out in Bismarck, like that has to be very intentional for them. And like for the two of us, like if we, if, if we or our wives sometimes like don't text each other and be like, Hey, we need to get together. Like it doesn't happen. And so, and it has to be intentional and otherwise like you are just going to go home and there's nothing wrong, especially for the two of us to be home a little bit more because we've got kids running around the house and a wife who needs us and stuff like that. But like the, and the communities can include them too. Um, but you have to be intentional or it's not, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and you know, the group text thread we're in is sure fun, but it doesn't replace it. No, correct. It, <laughs> correct. It a hundred percent needs to be in person. And yes, it is always our wives who are organizing it <laughs> and not us. Correct. So, so the last thing we probably need to talk about is that we get through the whole weekend of running around the Badlands filming. Uh, we come back to Melissa and Tyler's house and we interview them. It's like 1230. We have not, we have been up since like 430 in the morning and we are exhausted and you go to use the restroom in our makeshift sleeping area that I have become so familiar with in Tyler's house and you come out of the bathroom and find me doing what? (laughs) Sitting on the floor uh, and Tyler has in his basement um, WWF action figures along with like the, the ring that they are supposed to wrestle in. Yeah. Th- if you're like 35 to 45 years old, this was a part of your childhood. More than likely it's the blue plastic ring, uh, you know, like the bushwhackers and the, you know, ultimate warrior and Hulk Hogan. <laughs> they all were there. Superfly Jimmy Snuka. All of them are there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're, you're sitting on the floor and like the, you're, not only like playing with the toys and like how they're like supposed to be making moves on each other, but also narrating it as it happens. Of course. (laughs) And there for sure is footage of it. Yeah. Because you came out of the bathroom, I didn't hear you. And so I continued playing on as you filmed me doing this. (laughs) And uh, it's definitely a a highlight of my, you know, just the the laughter of it in this very exhausted state of like, yes, I'm playing with with the honky tonk man and Andre the giant right now. Yeah. And we had like, we had driven out there Friday. That's five ish hours, depending on stops and stuff like that. And Saturday we had got up and we had left at nine ish and filmed for 10 hours and drove around and hiked. And I don't, I don't remember how many miles we had hiked, but it was a lot that my phone told me. And that doesn't include elevation. And so we were all over the place. And then Sunday we went from basically 4.30 and then we had pulled in to the driveway probably at 9-ish and then had done, we had, I ran and grabbed McDonald's and conducted interviews and we finally got downstairs at like 12.30 and it was like three days and you're supposed to be sleeping normal and eating normal and we didn't. We did not. Oh, well. Uh, Aaron, thank you for coming on today and hanging out and, um, 
just discussing this. And if uh, people are, you know, like seeing you or like knowing you're a part of this, they will be happy to know also that we're going to do this all again next year as the uh, race organization has asked us to come back and do this on kind of a regular basis, it sounds like. So we, uh, we, we're we keeping the band together, but we're adding to it. We've added three other people that are going to come with us and, and make us a little bit more functional and uh, make sure that I uh, do my job and we know you're steady Eddie. So yeah, this is awesome, man. Yeah, thank you, John. That's been it was a blast, and the final product, how it turned out, like turned out so well, and so I'm, I can't wait to do it again. It's going to be awesome. Aaron Haugen, everybody, the DP of the Matahe Film. Thanks for listening today. If you want to hear Tyler Huber, Kelly McGelkey, and Nick Yabara share their stories from making the Matahe Film, you should head over to the Stable Cyclist YouTube channel where you can find the newly released behind the scenes episode focused exactly on that the Mata Hay documentary you of course can also find the Mata Hay film in the same place and finally you can find me on Instagram at the stable cyclist stable cyclist podcast is a twice monthly show focusing on long form conversations about bikes mentality and of course when the situation is right we will dive into mental health as well Episodes will always drop on the first and third Friday of each month, but we'll also have some bonus pods when possible, just like this one. Have an amazing day. Thanks for listening, and remember, you are loved.